In today's video, we're going to see if rethinking your approach to grace notes just might improve your technique. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident piper. If you like this kind of content, please think about giving the video a like, subscribing to the channel, and commenting below with any thoughts you might have. I also teach Skype and online lessons if you want more personalized instruction, but more on that later. In the description below, there's a link to the PDF document I have here, so go ahead, print that out, put it on a tablet, have it in front of you so you can follow along. Ah, the fingering technique of the Highland Bagpipe. It is quite the strange animal. When properly played, we're trying to have our fingers do two different things kind of simultaneously. We want to play both melodically, hearing all of the melody notes that are within our music, but we also need to move our fingers percussively. And the percussive motions are often called grace notes. So what we generally think of as grace notes aren't actually notes, they're percussive motions we're going to do with our fingers in a number of different ways. And what do I mean by percussive motions? Well, the idea when we're using grace notes to either separate notes of the same pitch or to change notes with some added emphasis, the grace note itself should not be so much tonal as percussive. So if we're on, say, an E and we want to play a second E, we could use either a lifting G grace note or a tapping grace note down to A to make two E's occur. But what we don't want to hear is an actual high G or a full-on clear low G. We want to hear more of a percussive attack on the channer. So let's think about it for a minute here. A lifting grace note, which in my you know, videos here are grace notes that initiate with a lifting motion and then come down, say like your standard G, D, and E grace notes. Well, if this were like a board in karate and this is your hand to chop said board, right now we have one board. The lifting grace note is the idea that you're going to bring it up and smack it down with like a one inch ninja punch to separate it now into two boards. Not a big, we're not, we're not waving high to mom with that grace note. When we lift that grace note finger, it should be a small percussive motion smacking back down on the channer. There is a certain amount of tension in your hand. No, don't get me wrong. It's not like a seven or a 10 out of 10, but it's certainly not a one either. We need that finger to come down and smack the channer. It's that coming down and smacking the channer that we hear, and we don't want it to be so big that you can really see the motion clearly. That's, that's not really the right idea. You can really hear that tonal high G rather than the percussive high G sound that we want. And that's the same for Ds and Es. Or even say, like the F grace note in an E doubling. And not. We don't want big bloopy grace notes. We want clear, precise, percussive grace notes. So again, a lifting grace note is the idea that if this was a board and this is your grace note finger, you are trying to break that board into two with a quick, percussive motion down onto the chanter in this case. Not a big slow motion, lift and chop. What about tapping grace notes? Well, to continue my silly karate analogy, if this again is the board we're trying to break, this is our grace note finger floating in the air because with a tapping grace note, that finger is already lifted above the chanter. The idea here is that you're going to come down, smack the chanter and back up quickly. We're not following all the way through, but we're definitely not just pressing down. We want to hear ta break it into two boards. And when you're done, that one long note does definitely become two, just like that board in karate, if you do it right, is snapped and broken into two. So say with like an E tapping down to low A, and not, I don't think we should be hearing a long tonal A, we should be hearing more of a short percussive A. Heavy D strikes. And not. And in addition to that, we have sweeping motions, which we typically do on high A and some sort of motion on our burl. Whether you do my style of burl, which is sweeping up and then down, or you do a seven where you sweep up and then back, or if you do the tap curl where you actually tap and curl back, 
in all of those, there's some sort of other motion. And in this case, rather than thinking of perhaps a board that we're breaking karate style, I want you to think about the jet of air coming out of your channel and that you're trying to just separate that quickly with that sweep. We don't want it to be so slow that the air kind of goes, we want it to kind of break that air almost like a bit of Morse code, bop, 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 or bop, bop, bop. But quick, again, percussive sweeping motions in this case, but what we're trying to break isn't the board, it's the air coming out. You can hear that's nice and percussive. I'm not pressing down very hard. I'm just trying to quickly move my finger across that jet of air coming out, you know, right on the channel, don't get me wrong, but right across that jet of air so that we can hear all of those low A's in a burl for the seven style. And the same thing for the high A whichever direction you choose to sweep. And if you are going to tap on that high A, make sure it's a nice light tap for the same reason as before. We don't want to hear a tonal. It's about creating a percussive motion to separate the sounds. Imagine if you were actually going to hit a drum and you wanted to do it slowly. You wanted to slow the tempo down. Well, when you go to hit the drum, you're not going to actually hit your stick slowly into the drum. You're going to pause longer between the beats, but you're still going to have to kind of snap that stick onto the drum head or it's not going to make any sort of real sound. The same goes for our grace notes. But what about embellishments? You know, those pesky things with more than one grace note in a row. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's actually not true. There isn't more than one grace note in a row. So let's take something like a grip. We see three grace notes in a grip, but really that note in the middle is the only actual grace note. The G's in the grip on either side of that D grace note are actually real notes that you're going to hear. And I've devised a note head system for our grace notes to more clearly delineate what is a grace note and what is not and what kind of grace note it is. In this silly system, and no, I'm not saying we should start rewriting our music, but it might be able to help you think about our tunes, our grace notes, our technique in a different way. So just go with me here for a minute. So for a lifting grace note, again, that is a grace note where the motion is initiated with a lift and then a smack back down. Instead of a round circle head on our grace note, what if we replaced it with an upward arrow? For a tapping grace note, rather than a round note head, what if we replaced that with a downward arrow? For a sweeping style grace note, what if we replace that with some sort of tilde head? It's the closest thing I could think of to a sweeping motion. But again, a tilde head rather than a round note head. So what if you wanted to notate a crossing noise, say between A to C, but we wanted to hear a quick crossing noise to that low G? What if we wrote, instead of a round circle head on that crossing noise low G, what if we put an X head there to show that it's, well, a cross? And that just leaves us with the notes in our embellishments that aren't grace notes, the ones I call sounding tones, the ones you want to hear, the C in the middle of a C doubling, the E in the middle of an E doubling, the two low Gs in a Taralua, the low A's in a Burl. One of the things I think this really helps with is that the various other symbols that I'm using right here have lighter visual weight, so they're not as heavy looking as the round dots. I think that helps delineate what is a grace note and what is a sounding tone within an embellishment. And I think it's visually easier to kind of make out not just the melody notes of the core melody of the tune, but all of the things in the tune that you want to hear as well. So I have a version of Scotland the Brave here where I have gone through and changed all of the grace notes and embellishments to use this new silly note head system to maybe reinforce the idea that our grace notes should be percussive motions rather than tonal motions and that you could visually see it. So if we look at the Scotland the Brave here, we can see E and then immediately that first grace note has that upward arrow. It's showing you that it's a percussive motion between E and a G grace note to A. And not. Then we immediately go into the tar lua, and you can see clearly here, you're going to go to a real low G. Again, that's what the round note head's telling you. Separate it with a lifting D grace note, then an E grace note taking you to the A. And when you see it like this, it can become easier to open up your embellishments and know what you can slow down and what you can't. Because if I wanted to play Scott and the Brave crazy slow, there's things I'd slow down. All of the notes with round note heads in this version. What would I not slow down? 
all of the notes that have some sort of other either upward arrow, downward arrow, or sweepy looking note head. And one thing before I give this version of Scotland the Brave a go for you all, I wanted to point out the light D throw on page one here. Notice there are no grace notes written in there, none of the percussive heads. That's because my approach to the light D throw, I think about it as three notes I want to hear. It's a real low G, a real D, and a real C. It's not a D grace note to C. And it's not a C tap between two Ds. I want to hear all three. And while talking about D throws, let's look at page two real quick. You can see I've written out the heavy D throw as I teach it in a video that there is a link to up here with the idea that you're going to go down to a sounding tone low G, then do an actual D grace note. So you see this one does have an upward arrow head to an X head on a low G. So I may need to actually have a crossing noise between that D grace note and the C we're landing on. And that extra crossing noise in there is what gives you that bubble of the heavy D throw. So check out that video. So let's go back to Scotland the Brave with the light D throw, and I'm going to play it with the sounding tones and theme notes, the big notes, all quite large, but all of the percussive grace noting remaining nice and crisp. <laughs> So if you really have command of the tunes in your repertoire, you should be able to take any of them and really expand them out like I just did and know which notes you can really kind of hold and which notes you need to keep nice and crisp. Now let's go ahead and give this a go at a more regular speed. I have this at 80 beats per minute and I'm using the Soundbrenner wearable metronome. There's more on that in a video that I've done up here, but any metronome will work. But really, I just want you to be able to follow along with what you're seeing and what you're hearing in real time between what sounds percussive and what sounds more tonal. And I've gone ahead and stuck a burl at the end of the part. I know that's normally not there, but I wanted to kind of show what that embellishment would look like at the end of a piece of music. So maybe, just maybe, you'll find that useful to hear Scott and the Brave while looking at it in a different context where you might be able to more clearly distinguish what is a grace note and what isn't. And one of the things I do like about this system, if anyone were to use it, is that I think it's immediately legible to anyone who's ever read any pipe music at all, and yet it makes it easier for the beginner to wrap their brains around what they're doing, why they're doing it, and when they're doing it. But moreover, rather than this silly note head system, I want you to think about your grace noting not as notes. They're not the percussive motions that allow other things to occur. They either allow the separation of notes of the same pitch, or they allow the emphasis of a note by changing with a grace note. So again, to think about it in my silly terms, if this is your channer and this is your grace note finger and you're doing a lifting grace note, that's like doing a karate chop, starting with your hand on the board and you wanna do a one inch ninja chop of that finger into the channer to separate that grace note crisply. And if it's a tapping grace note, your finger's already in the air and you wanna smack it down and return it to where it was and with enough force that it clearly covers the hole but does not allow like a big mm, tone. It's about a percussive sound separating the notes. But the internal rhythmic nature of bagpipe music is really incredible. There's a lot going on. But dum did it dum but did it dum did it dum did it did it dum did it dum but da dum but da dum da dum but da dum da dum da. 
there's a lot of quickly repeated notes. Either the notes in a melody, like doublings, and those tend to be repeated starting on the beat and then going after, or the notes in, say, something like a grip or taralua, and those tend to be repeated from in the embellishment rather than the notes around it, and those tend to come from before it. Ba bum, do do dum, bum, did it, dum, did it, dum, dee dee dee, do do dee dum, did it, dum. And then you have the D throw, which is its own animal that kind of goes across the beat. Oh, ba do dum, bum, bum, da dum, da da, ba da dum, da dum, dum, da da, da da, da dum, do do dum, but did it, dum, did it, dum, dee dee dee. Do do dee dum did it do o ba do dum bum bum da da dum da da dum do do dum do ba dum da da dum. So maybe that little primer can help you remember where things fall before or after the beat. There'll probably be a future video going more into depth on that, but that internal rhythmic nature involves both melodic notes that we want to hear and percussive motions that allow them to occur on an instrument where we can't otherwise stop the sound with our breath or tongue. The air is constantly going through that reed on the pipes, so we've had to come up with other tools to allow us to do all of the amazing things we can do with this instrument. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you got something out of this video, please think about giving it a like, sharing it with any other pipers you might know, and commenting below with your thoughts or opinions on this rather odd way of thinking, perhaps, about grace notes. I also have a Patreon where as little as a dollar a month goes a long way to helping support the channel. And you'll see names now of folks scrolling up, including Miss Carrie Tresek, my number one supporter. But these are folks that support the channel monthly, and I'd love to add your name to this list. You often get access to videos early and other perks, so go check out my Patreon. I also teach Skype and online lessons. Go ahead and head over to www.commandyourbagpipe.com or email me at the address you see down here, and we'll get you going. I'm working with folks from all over the planet, and I hope to work with you soon. I also have a line of Command Your Bagpipe merchandise like this very fine hoodie I'm wearing today, but there's also hats and mugs and t-shirts and water bottles, so go check that out and let the world know that you Command your bagpipe. All right, everybody. Again, I'm Matt Willis, bagpiper. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.